Hey everybody, what's going on and welcome to Guns N' Roses Central and today we're back with another episode of Guns N' Roses True Stories. So I've covered all the songs in Appetite, GNR Lies, on the Use Your Illusion albums and a handful of tracks off the Spaghetti Incident and Interview with the Vampire as well as Live Era and the Greatest Hits album. So today we're going to be talking about the title track from the uh, much anticipated Chinese Democracy album. So the... the uh, the title track is actually uh, written by both Axel and Josh Fries, who was one of the first drummers that Axel worked with after Matt Sorum had left and Slash and Duff had left as well. So this was actually the first single released from the album Chinese Democracy. And it's the first single of original material released by the band since Estranged, which was released in 1994. So before Guns N' Roses released Chinese Democracy, they did a lot of touring throughout the early 2000s, as well as in 2006, 2007. And at a show that Guns N' Roses did at the House of Blues in Las Vegas in 2001, Axel talked a bit about the origin of the song. Here's what he had to say. This, uh, this next song is um, something new. You know, right before I came here, you know, when I left LA, you know, the movie Kundun was on about the Dalai Lama. I kind of like the idea that we're playing the House of Blues because it's kind of associated with that. That came about, I was at the House of Blues in Chicago when Vegas called me. Gig for Rio at the House of Blues. And... Sure. So, you know, I was I was getting ready to, to leave, and you know, the TV was on, and it was the end of the, the movie, and the Dalai Lama is about to cross over the border, you know, to be in exile for the rest of his life from his own country, and he looks back at uh, at the men who helped him you know, es escape the Chinese government. And, and he looks back at them and he waves and they wave at him. And then they show a scene where he looks back at them again and he sees every one of them dead because he knew that they would be killed. They knew that in helping him, they would be killed. And, uh, you know, the emotion in this next song, it's, that's all that's about it. it. It's not like an intelligent song. It doesn't have the answer to anything. But it's the title track of the record, which, God willing, we will finish. And it's not necessarily pro or con about China. It's just that right now, China symbolizes one of the strongest yet most impressive countries and governments in the world. And we are fortunate to live in a free country. And so in thinking about that, it just kind of upset me. So, uh, drummer Josh Fries, who wrote the song with Axel, uh, he was the drummer for Guns N' Roses between 1998 and the year 2000. And he's been interviewed after the album came out, and here's what he had to say about the song. He said, that's a wacky feather in my cap. After 10 years, I was ready to see the song have eight different writers on it, but it didn't get convoluted and effed up. I think they made the intro longer. I, I'd have them cut it right into the thing. It's a simple bonehead rock song with a big riff that I'm assuming will be perfect for Guitar Hero one day. He also was interviewed in 2014 where he said, one of my favorite strange feathers in my cap that I have is whatever I walk into a room full of people and they're talking about Chinese democracy, just this whole debacle of the record that took 100 years to make and cost a million dollars, I'll walk into a room full of people and go, what are you guys talking about? They go, Chinese democracy. And I'll raise my hand and go, I wrote Chinese democracy because I wrote the music to the song. I didn't write anything else on the album. I wrote a couple of other things that didn't make it on the album. When I left, there were still seven or eight years before the album came out but it always makes me laugh. It's not like I wrote track 10 or something. I wrote Chinese Democracy. Some people told me I shouldn't brag about that. Actually, I like the song, and it's it's now, it's not just because I wrote it. It's because it's a really dumb, simple, dirty guitar riff. It's cool. I think it's one of the better ones on the record. So 
so Josh Freese not only played drums on uh, Chinese Democracy, but he also played um, with Slash on his solo album, which came out in 2010. So Josh Freese played drums on most of the tracks. There's a couple exceptions like Watch This and Baby Can't Drive. And I think there was another song too where she didn't play on, but he plays on most of the record. And if you guys have seen the behind the scenes uh, footage of uh, the uh, the actual album, it's up on YouTube. It's about 20 minutes, 25 minutes long. You can actually see Josh Freese in the studio playing drums. So here's an interview that Josh Freese did talking about his time with Guns N' Roses and why he left the band. So he signed a two-year contract with Guns N' Roses from 98 to 2000. And he said, you know, he really enjoyed working with Axel. He had no issues with him, but he just didn't see any light at the end of the tunnel in terms of the album coming out anytime soon. More from the Dragonfly, um, like in Cole and Willoughby. Anyways, I'm there rehearsing, and I had a pager, okay, 97, nice. right? Pager. I might have had a cell phone, but yeah. I didn't know the phone number. It's, it's, it's it, You opened it for, like, if you blew a tire or you're, or you're getting carjacked, you would use it for an emergency, you know? Um, so anyway, my pager goes off, and I'm like, what the hell is this weird Orange County number? And I call it. And it was the manager who was in Laguna at the time, South Orange County. Hey, Guns N' Roses are looking for a drummer, and they're interested in you auditioning. Would you be into it? And I was like, Yeah. Um, I think I just kind of hurried off the phone. I was like, I kind of like mumbled a few things and kind of like tiptoed backwards out of the conversation because it wasn't something that I was really into at the time. And I kind of, I forgot, I, I ended up being polite about it, but we ended up, I ended up hanging up and going, I don't know if I want to audition for Guns N' Roses. Like I was, I was, I had this band that was signed to A and M Records at the time that that fell apart quickly due to drugs, unfortunately. But a band called Slider it was a very cool band, way too short lived. But this band that I was trying to do on A and M called Slider, and I was playing with the Vandals, and um, and I was playing with Devo. Mm -hmm. But both the Vandals and Devo, neither of them were full time jobs. Neither of them were, you know. But I was doing gigs with Devo. I was doing gigs with the Vandals. I was playing on some records. You know what I mean? I was making a living. Yeah doing exactly what I wanted to do. And uh, I was like, I don't know if I want to go join Guns N' Roses. You weren't crazy about the music. Yeah. Right? I mean, I liked Guns N' Roses. But I'm, like, but I'm like, what do you mean Guns N' Roses? I mean, isn't Guns N' Roses Slash and Izzy and those, none of those dudes are in the band anymore? Or what's going on? I don't know. They called again. and uh, Or I told them I'd call them back. or something. That's what it was. I called them back. When I called them back, I'm like, you know what? I should go down and just meet Axel. Mm -hmm. At this point, he'd been out of the limelight for a while he'd been out of the spotlight and uh and there's all these weird rumors about him oh i heard he's 300 pounds and he's bald right. and this right, right, right. and well you know i should go meet him i want to go meet him you know i mean i'll have my i can form my own opinion about yeah. the guy rather than yeah. hearing all these rumors about him right you know does he drive himself there or does he take a helicopter you know or a limo or yeah, yeah, how's yeah. he how's he what's he rolling up yeah. in these days man yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, so I went down to, to, to do it, and uh, and he was cool. Actually, the, the first time I went down there, he wasn't there. I auditioned, and um, oddly enough, the two guys auditioning me were guys that I would later be in two separate bands with. The guy that was playing bass, because they didn't have a bass player at the time, was Guns N' Roses Pro Tools engineer at the time, Billy Howardell, who would let, later do a perfect circle, right? He was okay. he's the guitarist in a perfect okay, circle. okay, okay. But he was just the Pro Tools guy, and he strapped on a bass, and I had no idea. I was like, who's the weird bass roadie? Who's the bald bass roadie that's going to jam with us? Like, I had to, like, later, he and I toured for years and had this perfect circle band. And then on guitar was Robin Fink, who was the guitar player who just left Nine Inch Nails to do Guns N' Roses, and would later leave Guns N' Roses and rejoin Nine Inch Nails. And I played with them in Nine Inch Nails for a bit. Anyways, so we're down at the complex in West L.A. or Santa Monica, wherever that is, and... Uh, I auditioned and it went well and they're like we, we want you to come back and Axel wants to meet you and I was like cool so I came down and met Axel and, and I liked him and he seemed like a cool guy and uh, and I had so many people telling me not to do it and actually to uh, not to bring him up again but I remember talking to Paul Westerberg Westerberg was the only one that said you should do it go do it if everyone's telling you not to do it you should go do it I went yeah you're right what What am I just join some cool alternative rock band I was like in the late 90s what am I going to be in a, a grunge band I'm gonna, and I had friends begging me I, they'll remain nameless a couple of, in case any guys of Rosa people hear this no, there's a couple guys in pretty famous bands that I'm friends with. They were begging me, like, dude, what are you doing? What are you doing? You can't be in Guns N' Roses. Dude, you're insane to think you're going to go be in Guns N' Roses. I'm like, yeah, I think I'm going to give it a shot. So uh, I went, I did it, and I signed a two-year contract. And part of his action was like, hey, yeah, I mean, if you know, if you write music and 
I ended up writing one of the songs on that record. I mean, I, qu- I quit before the record was done because I, I spent two years in the studio with them. Mm-hmm. The first year I was there like five nights a week. I'd drive from Long Beach up to the valley, deep in the valley, like at nine at night, ten at night, and work till like four, five, six in the morning, you know, five nights a week for the first year. S- give or take a week or two, he- we'd have off. And actually, it was cool if I said, hey, man, you know, the Vandals want to go to Europe in November for like two weeks. Are you cool with that? He'd be like, no problem. Go do it. Mm-hmm. Hey, man, Devo's going to go to New York at the end of January for three gigs. Can I go to New York? Cool. No problem. And the second year I was down there, 99, it was way looser. By I the would, way, I don't mean to cut you off. I'm just gonna, yeah. I, I wanted to, I was sure. I'm just curious. When you do that, when you start off and it's like, hey, here's a contractor, are they saying, this is the this is the amount we're offering? Is it is it holy shit numbers no, at the time? Not at all. No. Money? Not wise? at all. No. And there's a lot of rumors. You know, everyone's like, dude, I heard you got paid a million dollars. You want to put your pinky up like Austin Powers. <laughs> One million dollars. <laughs> right, right. Did you want to go like that at all. No. Nothing like that. It was good money, and it was good money for me at the time, being a single uh, guy with no kids and being, well, how? let me think, how, how old was I? Probably about 24, 25, <laughs> I, mean, I guess. 24, 25? Yeah, I was getting a weekly, a decent size weekly paycheck, and I was still being able to, like, because I was doing it in the evenings, I was still, this is when records were happening all the freaking time, too. So I'm playing on records all day. I'm doing sessions right, right. during the day, and then going there at night and doing his thing. And, um,. Not touring a lot, but not needing to, and not even thinking about. It. I mean, like I said, going out of town once in a while with the Vandals, or once in a while with right. you. You had to get permission and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your boss, and I it mean. was only for a week or two at a time. It was no long term, but it was great. I was I was making a bunch of records during the day with people, and then going and working with Axel at night. And uh, but yeah, I'd hear rumors from people. There was no, I, I didn't get a big signing bonus, right? You know, and right. I wasn't out shopping for Ferraris the next day or anything. It's like, like, wow, well, okay, I'm gonna make good money every week. This is great. It's cool. I don't have to worry about rent, and you know it was awesome. You know it was it, it, it was it was good, but it wasn't ridiculous. It okay. wasn't go buy yourself a car, right. crazy car and a cool right. house. It, none of that shit. But you know, but I've heard through the grapevine, people say, "Hey, I heard that you know you got this, you got that." And it's 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 usually not the case, you know, when people think that kind of shit, you know. But who knows? You know, I don't know. I mean, I read some stories about Robert Trujillo, who I used to play with. Who plays bass in Metallica? Yeah, that was now. in the movie. They, they, they yeah, gave didn't a million they give, dollars yeah. signing bonus, basically. There like, you go. Well, that happened to Robert, not, but not to yours truly. <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I got nothing. I got a rock, man. It's like Charlie Brown on fucking Halloween. But uh, so you were but, saying that going into the second year or something, you were because you said the first year, year was was all good. You're saying it was uh, all, and it's not that the second year wasn't good. It's just the second year we were kind of running out of things to do. You know what I mean? And the this the rec- record wasn't <laughs> only, done. You know, and uh, was that a pain in the ass? I mean, come on, was it was it a pain in the ass working with? You know what? In it, that? it it wasn't, but I, I it wasn't for me. You might talk to other people that say it was, but see, for me too, everyone's kind of always looking for a, a good actual story from me or a crazy actual story from me, and I really don't have any. I mean, I know that they're out there, but my personal experience and experiences with him, he was always cool to me. It was, I, I don't have anything bad to say about right, the guy, you know? Right. And this reality is different than yours or mine or most everybody's. And so I had kind of a, a weird run, you know, from, from what I know about him, from, you know, when he was a kid or a teenager up into becoming really famous and having all that power and, and money and shit. It's got to be weird, especially when you're a kid. I mean, he lives in a different world. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, you know? And and you can't, it's just the way it worked out. You can't even blame him for it. I don't, you know, when I, even when I do hear a story about him, I don't go, oh man, this or that. I go, I just, I feel bad for him, you know, sometimes, you know, but, but anyways, I like the dude, never had any uh, issues with him. So that wasn't why you left or anything? No. Well, I mean, I left because we were ending year two of sitting in a studio and this record still wasn't going to, didn't look like it was to be done anytime soon. (laughs) So I'm sitting there going, okay, I've, I've sat here for two years. I like everyone down here. I don't have a problem with anyone in this room. I like Axel. I like some of the record we've been making. Do I think it's going to be out a year from now? I don't know. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I've been here for two years. I'd be surprised if it was out in the next year. Yeah. So I was getting discouraged. I was getting frustrated and discouraged like a lot of people. And I think like a lot of people w- would be if they were in that position. So in the meantime, I had on the weekends been messing around with Billy Howardell and Maynard. I met Maynard, James Keenan on the... So let's look at who actually played on the song because even though Josh Freese helped write the song, 
because Guns N' Roses worked with so many producers over the years, over the course of the album, they re-recorded the song a number of times. So even if you look at the liner notes, uh, you know, Bumblefoot played on it, even though he didn't really join the band until like the middle 2000s. Uh, we also had Paul Tobias play on it, Richard Fortas, Robin Fink, Buckethead. Uh, Frank actually plays drums on it. And then we also had Chris Pittman and Dizzy Reed as well. And there was actually an interview that Bumblefoot did about Chinese democracy, and he talked about his contribution to the album, so he said, or to the song. He said, I added the fretless riffs behind the verses, and that was really my main contribution to the song. We also had Tommy Stinson talk a bit about the song. He said um, it, it, Chinese democracy was one of his favorite songs to play in the set list. He also said uh, to play live, he said Chinese democracy is pretty much fun to play. That is just a barn burner really effing in your face. So let's talk about the reception that the song received. So, you know, Guns N' Roses have been working on this album for 14 years. And when the song was released, it received a mostly positive reception from critics. So it was played over 4 million times on MySpace in one day. Spin Magazine noted that with a thick, uh, muscular four-chord riff and the Axel Banshee well, uh, only the most stubbornly jaded will manage to suppress the goosebump reflex, but criticized it for being hook-free. And the Los Angeles Times, on the other hand, described Axel as the most ambitious hard rocker of the late 20th century. And though also noting that the chorus is just an extension of the verses and the song therefore doesn't behave the way radio-friendly singles usually do. And stated that the refrain sticks after several listens. Ultimately, the Los Angeles Times concluded that the song brings back a passionate weirdness that the hard rock airwaves have lacked. And also compared it to David Bowie's I'm Afraid of Americans, noting that both songs have suffocated quality um, as their makers are pushing through the smoke to express these thoughts. It's the sound of florid romantic rockers uh, aiming for something cold and modern. There's also a clip on YouTube of Howard Stern listening to Chinese Democracy for the first time and giving his thoughts on the song. So I've linked to it down below. Um, you know, they seem like they liked the song and uh, they did play There Was a Time shortly after it. And then, you know, unfortunately, Howard doesn't really talk a whole lot about the song. But if you guys want to listen to what Howard's thoughts are, I've linked to it down below. So the song was also the theme song for WWE's Armageddon 2008 pay-per-view event, and the song was also released as a piece of downloadable content for the video game Rock Band 2. So the entire album, actually, Chinese Democracy, was released for Rock Band 2 in April of 2009. Now the song charted in several countries, in fact, it charted in a number of different countries, and it even reached the Billboard Hot 100 uh, charts. It hit number 34 on those charts. So you guys are probably wondering, well, what did the other Guns N' Roses members think, think of the title track? So uh, when the song first came out, uh, Slash said he reacted positively to the title track. He said, that sounds cool. It's good to hear Axel's voice again, you know. And uh, even um, Matt Sorum was interviewed too, and he said that he liked the actual track. He said it wasn't one of the songs that they were working on when he was in the band up until late 97, and he liked the mixing of the song as well. There's been other reactions, but there have been more to the entire album, so I'll cover this in a different video. So let's talk about where the song ranks on the best horse Guns N' Roses song list. So out of the 80 songs that Guns N' Roses have done, Spin.com ranked it as 36th, and then even uh, Medium.com ranked it as 41st. So it's kind of in the middle of the pack, maybe just a little bit lower in the middle. But that does it for this uh, True Story episode, guys. Let me know what your thoughts are. Are you guys a fan of Chinese democracy? Comment down below and let me know. And be sure to hit the like button if you enjoyed the video. And subscribe if you love Guns N' Roses and want to see more videos just like this. You guys can also follow me on Facebook and Twitter. The links to my social media channels are down below. And you can also support me on Patreon. The links to my Patreon page are down below in the description box as well. Take care.